OK. Uh, uh, we all know Pepe was a remarkable scientist and a unique mind, and that his figure, his legacy, have influenced scores of scientists. Uh, many of them present here today or listening in. Um, so for that reason, I must thank the organizers, not only for putting all this together today, but for also giving me the privilege of being one of the few to have the opportunity to share with you a few examples, a couple of examples of how his legacy have marked the research we do. Um, I also belong to the first generation of PhD students, and I joined the lab at the time that, uh, that Andres was already there, and Amanda, Rafa, Joaquin, who are all the present here. Um, so I share a lot about the excitement and the different topics that Javier, uh, 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 sorry, Andres has talked about. Um, and I also have the opportunity to discuss with a lot of us uh, invited collaborators that shed so much, so much light on all the different exciting genetic approaches of the time. My thesis felt somehow a little bit more molecular to the projects that were carried out at the time due to the reluctance of AS200, a particular insertion sequence of, on Salmonella, to actually transpose. So uh, my thesis ended up being the characterization of the molecular mechanisms that repress transposition. So I didn't feel, feel at the time that um, I was using so much genetic, classical genetic analysis when I left the lab. Um, and I wasn't planning on doing many more because I joined a lab in Imperial College, David Holden's lab, uh, that to begin with has not been a salmonella lab and had just started a couple of years before I joined to work on salmonella. And they were planning, the project was uh, aimed at using all those new techniques of protein-protein interaction, epitope tagging, fluorescent labeling, mice work. So I didn't think genet classical genetics was going to have a, a strong role on, on what I was doing. So what I'm going to tell you as the first example of how his legacy influenced my research concerns to this part uh, of my uh, career. So it's not very current. But I have, uh, but it's, it's a very clear indication of how strong his legacy was. So I had to, at the time, we have uh, at the lab have many, many uh, genes that have been identified through a genetics uh, screening as involved in and, and required for salmonella proliferation in the mice. So it's a systemic part of the infection. So um, there were so many genes that were interesting to pursue that we were a bit of a loss of how to pick the ones that were interesting to follow and how to group the characterization, etc. And there was a lot of mice work involved and, and I was thrown in the course the first week I arrived and I hated it. I hated it with all my heart. So that was one of the strong motivations to try to find a way of uh, optimizing that part of analysis. Um, and this is where the genetics came first to my rescue. Um, in the lab, they were starting to move from the classical uh, mice assay in which you will inoculate uh, dozens of animals, the wild type or a mutant, and compare the results, and they were using mixed infections to establish the relative ratio of a given mutant to colonize uh, a mouse hole, like a spleen. So what I started to do was combining those assays, which allow, reduce the variation between different experiments and allow a much lower number of mice to be used per each assay to carry out classical genetic analysis. So starting to compare double mutants with single mutants and see whether or not the virulence uh, attenuation was additive as a means to establish as a means to establish whether or not the two genes that we were analyzing were contributing independently to virulence, therefore they were additive or not. And this proved to be a very successful and very easy to do uh, analysis. So we carry through a lot of a lot of, a lot of mutants and allow us to group together those that are, were actually working on the same virulence pathway and save the lab a lot of mice work. Unfortunately, it didn't save me a lot of, a lot of mice work because I ended up doing the analysis for most of my lab colleagues, but at least we save a lot of mice. Uh, but it did help me personally a lot in what it was my, later on my main project. I was uh, characterizing a very interesting 
uh, gene, which was uh, discovered by someone at Paco, also present here in the audience. Um, we have all sorts of very interesting uh, phenotypes, uh, intracellular phenotypes in tissue culture cells. And we, uh, how our hypothesis was that CFA was a type 3 secreted effector. So we have this project that was developing in which we were characterizing the role of a SPI2 type 3 secretion system on the phenotypes of CFA and the CFA phenotypes on the characteristics that we have already established for the SPI2 mutant. And everything was really, really exciting and very nice. But it depended, it depended of the fact that CFA must be a type 3 secreted effector for everything to work together. And we couldn't demonstrate that. We tried every trick on the book back then, and a lot of people, including Javier, who is also present here in the audience, uh, wasted weeks or even months trying to demonstrate that CFA was a mutant, and we couldn't. In fact, it took years uh, to be demonstrated directly. So here, genetics came back to the rescue again. So it, in my experience, uh, desperation have led us to genetics in many, many occasions. So we went back to use the approach that I have told you about to establish that CFA and the type 3 secretion system did not contribute independently to the lab. That was the first genetic link between the two functions. Then we, um, taking advantage of the fact that intracellularly, a type 3 secretion mutant and a CFA mutant have strikingly different phenotypes, we established using uh, double mutant that the type 3 secretion mutation was epistatic to CFA. And therefore, CFA required of a function at type 3 secretion system to carry out this function which was the second line of evidence. And then finally, we ended up showing that a CFA mutant could be complemented by expressing the protein from the host cell cytosol. These three lines of genetic evidence allow us to bridge the gap, uh, bring together these two sides of the story and publish the paper which, that became um, a main contribution to the salmonella field and somewhat um, uh, relevant to the field because it somehow changed the way uh, intracellular lifestyle of salmonella was viewed. Uh, even though Pepe was not directly involved in this, uh, in this story, it did influence the story so strongly as to be responsible for the experiments that joined together and allowed the publication. And it was also one of the reasons why I always kept in contact with him because um, not being a traditional uh, bacterial genetic, uh, but bacterial sal salmonella genetics lab, the, the lab I joined, although now is a reference lab in the field, um, I, I found very refreshing and very stimulating to go back every time I came here, uh, talking to Pepe about these things, and he always came up with uh, interesting suggestions. So when I moved back to Spain and I started uh, the lab uh, that I let um, call it ever since in the University of Malaga, um, I wanted to be able to use many of these genetic uh, tools and approaches in my new system. I changed uh, pathogens and I moved to Pseudomonas syringe, a plant pathogen, um, and a new pathosystem, uh, the plants as a host. And this also added the dimension of being able to do genetic analysis on the plant, and that is actually something very nice, but I'm not going to get into it today. Uh, but it made us uh, want to develop all the lovely tools that were available for salmonella, of course. Many of them, most of them were not available, so we did have, and we still do a lot of work trying to uh, develop molecular tools to be able to, to use the same approaches or similar approaches. And we are you know, close to do almost as many things and almost as easy as they are done in salmonella. The, another connecting thing is the, the type 3 secretion system is also essential to establish the, the the pathogenic process on the plant. And you can see here these the clumps of red things, um, chloroplasts, this is the interior of a leaf. And you can see here how in the intercellular spaces, uh, Pseudomonas syringe wild type bacteria form a microcolony. But if you have a type 3 secretion mutant, it's incapable of doing so, unless they're close together and they can share the common goods. So um, one of the things we did uh, import from Salmonella was the uh, mixed infections and the possibility of doing this uh, genetic analysis on the colonization of the host. And we did it, we use it for regulation, like uh, Pepe has used it many times, but we also use it to sort through a rather large inventory of type 3 secreted effectors. And, and we carry out a epistasis analysis so we put together, we can classify 
those are effectors that were contributed in direct, um, independently to buildings, for instance, these two, these two uh, HOP AB1 and HOP I1, uh, the double mutant compared to the single mutant is still attenuated, so each of the attenuated uh, phenotypes are independent, or this other example in which the double example is the double mutant is like the single mutant, therefore they're contributed together, which means that they're working together in the same uh, virulence pathway, therefore it makes sense to approach the characterization together. So these have been very useful. And um, brings me to the last a bit of a, uh, the last minute of my talk in which I want to tell you about the second uh, big uh, influence uh, of Pepe legacies in the way we do science. And I'm going to be doing a little bit of a spoiler because I'm going to be introducing here a topic that will be uh, much uh, talk about later on, the topic of a phenotypic heterogeneity. So not to do a full a spoiler, I'm not going to get into all the different aspects uh, of introducing the concept, but um, I'm going to tell you how uh, knowing about the work that they were doing at Pepe's lab on this regard have influenced our research. So to put it into context, um, in Pseudomonasiringe and before in Salmonella, we always observed something that was puzzling and came recurrently into our discussion. Um, if, even though it's very clear that when you analyze a mutant and a wild type, for instance, a type 3 secretion mutant and a wild type in mice or in, or in plants, uh, you can see how the wild type population is much larger, much larger than the wild mutant and how it can colonize much better. When you look down directly to the site of infection, when you go into the ground, since things are not as clear. So for instance, in this picture, we can see the interior of a leaf and we can see the interior of a leaf and we can see these uh, big fat brown microcolonies, which are the typical from the wild type. This is a constitutively expressed um, YFP. But you can also see that the same bacteria, the same wild type within the same tissue is actually sometimes doing something different. And it's not looking as doing quite as well. And it's just, it's somehow like there for whatever the reason, the infection failed and the interaction didn't go as expected. And that was something very common. There was always there whenever you actually looked down the microscope. And we never actually, you know, we talk about all sorts of reasons and perhaps some of them are still true, but we never actually came up to a way of addressing that experimentally. And in that context, um, I have the opportunity to become uh, familiar with the phenotypic heterogeneity a concept uh, while assisting to the thesis of Sarah Hernandez, uh, in which uh, I realized that uh, Pepe's lab, they were working on several systems that were uh, expressed heterogeneously in genetically homogeneous populations and homogeneous conditions. So that was a mind blowing concept for us. And suddenly, the, everything fitted together. I mean, we didn't know how, um, but we were absolutely certain that something like this was going on in our systems and was somehow explaining part of the heterogeneity we, we were actually um, observing. So we jumped in with two feet and, and generated our transcriptional fusions to GFP of our favorite type 3 secretion genes, and voila, there we go. These are bacteria that are extracted from the plant leaf and you can see how this is a stain for all of our bacteria and this is the GFP expression of each of the genes and you can see that not all bacteria are expressing the genes even though they are in conditions in which the gene is supposed to be essential. So we this actually looks like a, a very nice bimodal distribution when you look in the more homogeneous environment of the, of the lab. And then we took all our arsenal of regulation mutants to try to identify what was behind this, uh, this bimodal distribution. And we identify a double negative regulatory loop as responsible for establishing this differentiation between off and on bacteria. Um, this is not the only event in which this type of process have been observed. We have also uh, investigated the flagellar expression because we have observed previously a, some a counter regulation between flagella and type 3 secretion mutants to the monocyringe. So we have characterized as well the expression, single cell expression of flagelli uh, and other flagellar genes. And you can see here it's also very heterogeneous. If you see some membrane stain, this is the actual inside of a, of a leaf. So these clumps uh, identify the, where the plant cells are. And then you can see the microcolony because it's expressing constitutively uh, ECFP. Uh, and you can see that only a few of the bacteria randomly 
seemingly randomly uh, distributed on the microcolony are expressing uh, fly C. And the interesting thing is that even though it is true that these two loci are counter-regulated, uh, that counter-regulation is not responsible for the heterogeneity that we see in one and the other. These two processes are genetically independent or epigenetically independent, we don't know. Uh, we are working on that as well. But they arise from different mechanisms and you can knock out the counter-regulation without affecting the heterogeneity. And we also, perhaps because of that, we can get in the, a single population, a genetically homogeneous population, we can observe four phenotypically different populations. One expressing only the type 3 or only the flagella and others expressing both or none. And actually all of them quite abundant. So this already throws a lot of complexity to the way uh, what we usually see as a single straight population is actually a lot more complex than that. And we uh, hope to add a few extra layers to this because we have identified another um, potentially phenotypic heterogeneous um, loci. And the last thing I want to say about this is that we have been in the last year characterizing what kind of effect this can have on the, what kind of adaptive value this can bring to the pathogen. Um, it's a shame that as Andres was saying, now that we have all the results, we won't be able to discuss it uh, with Pepe because I'm sure it would be, it would have been extremely rich and helpful discussion. Uh, because what we see is that the populations uh, the percentage of the populations activated for one or the other actually varies with time during the infection of a plant. Um, and it can vary if you change the context of the defense uh, set up by the plant. So we believe this follows a, a model of division of labor in the population. Um, uh, it will have been great to discuss it with Pepe. And with this, thanking Pepe for the very strong influence uh, I'm sure I convince you he has had in our science, the people that have carried out the work and our collaborators and the funding. And of course, you guys for giving me these few minutes. Thank you.